Well, hello and welcome to the special Monday edition of DC Today. Uh, last week of September, last week of Q3, I am back in the Newport Beach office, got back in the middle of the night, and we have hit the ground running today. Had a big investment committee meeting this morning, big meeting with our whole advisory team, and a lot of things uh, happening. There was a very active week for us in the markets last week, um, and now I have a lot to say to you here today. I can't today capture everything on the podcast and the video that I wrote about um, uh, being in New York City over the weekend, having a long flight in the middle of the night gives me a lot of chance to read and write and make DC Today longer. And so there's just kind of more meat on the bone in the written DC Today today than uh, I will have time to give you here on the podcast. But by way of just market summary today, futures had opened last night 40 points to the upside and went a little higher into the evening. And then this morning we're down about 90 um, a few hours before market opened. And, and actually the market did open down about 100 points. It just sort of zigged and zagged throughout the day from there. And then it actually opened, uh, closed rather to the upside, but only 43 points. The Dow was down 1.7% last week. I think that was about 600, 650 points in the week and far worse, you know, with the S&P and the NASDAQ. So you had a, a very difficult week in, in uh, last week, the third week of September. Markets are down in the month of September, down in the month of August. They had been up nicely in the month of July. So total Q3, we'll see. You only got four days left now, but it looks as if we'll finish this third quarter negative in, in the various stock markets. Um, and most of that is really quite well correlated to bonds. And the bond market uh, today, again, uh, got hit. The long bond, again, down as the 10-year uh, bond yield was up nine basis points, up to 4.53%. So you can say, well, you know, things have been going so well in the market. But this is a chart I put in D.C. today that I just think tells the entire story. It is so incredibly important for people to understand. Um, you have an S&P 7, okay, let's call it seven companies, and then you have 493 other companies. And for those that don't have a calculator handy, the seven and the 493 together it is the S&P 500. The S&P 7 is up 50% on the year. The S&P 493 is basically flat, okay? So you can say, all right, well, why is that a problem? Why don't we just own those seven? Or why don't we own everything with those seven? The problem is it is inherently unsustainable and violently so to where when that reversion happens for the seven, not only do the seven wipe away the gains they previously gave and sometimes then some and sometimes faces get ripped off, but it speaks to um, that lack of breadth that severe lack of breath in this case, creating a lot of vulnerability for the rest of the overall market. And so right now, when seven companies are 34% of the index and are trading at a blended PE of 50 times earnings, seven companies, 34% of the index, 50 times earnings. That's the reality. And so I think that um, a lot of what you're seeing in markets has to do with a lack of breadth and a uh, probably bubble-like condition that had surfaced with some of these big names. Um, and where we go from here is TBD. I do believe that within that 493, there are pockets that are a lot less vulnerable than within those seven, okay? Now today, uh, one day only, the top performing sector was energy. It was up 1.28%. But the bottom performing sector was consumer staples, which is down 0.43. Um, you had decent day in financials. You had more uh, weakness in utilities. Um, I think, you know, the shiny object space, I'm not referring to the big seven. I'm referring to even shinier stuff like IPOs, for example. You know, you, you had a big run up in... in uh, on the day in which they went public and two very large uh, IPO uh, companies in the last few weeks that have both given back all of those gains back to their offering price the, from where they were on, on day one. You just you lured in a lot of speculative investors and then they just got hammered immediately as, as things kind of resettled 
when the um, investment banks were done supporting that, that IPO. Um, th those are tricky conditions. I don't happen to believe it's true that you need all kinds of frothy, juicy, happy-go-lucky things happening in IPOs to feel like animal spirits come back to markets. I think markets trade off of earnings, and I don't think any IPO craze, let alone IPO debacle, changes that. But nevertheless, those who have generally wanted to see IPO frenzy as a positive sign for markets, they must not be feeling like it's positive in markets right now. 56% uh, of the names in the S&P 500 are currently below their 200-day moving average. So that's what I mean by lack of breadth. Um, as we get ready to move past the markets conversation, final thing, Chinese bond yields have moved higher too. So you definitely have U.S. bond yields moving higher, concerns about higher for longer from our central bank. You've seen it around the globe, Germany, Italy, uh, Canada. But all of those central banks have been tightening and talking about staying tight, most notoriously the Fed. Not China. China's central bank is cutting rates, and, and their bond yields have moved higher as well. So it, bo it, it behooves us to think about this in a little more sophisticated of a manner than just assuming that it's the central banks driving it. I think that there is a lot at, at play here involving currency, Forex, and other countries taking their P's and Q's from our own central bank. Um, to move into top news stories, I did uh, wake up, if you want to call it that, um, after my, my flight home and a little rest into the morning to the news that the um, writer's strike in Hollywood had come to an end and that the studio heads and writers had reached an agreement. Um, Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey in the U.S. Senate was indicted federal charges on Friday. Uh, around bribery and so forth, and he did announce today his intent, intention to fight those charges and to not resign from his seat. The far bigger things people are focused on moving to public policy is the status of the shutdown. I think you're well above uh, 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 80, 90 percent chance even that that shutdown will happen going into next week. Um, I think Speaker McCarthy is going to try to push forward a package of various appropriations bills this week send him to the House for a vote. I don't know if he has the votes there or not, and it's totally irrelevant if he does from a shutdown standpoint because they'll certainly be dead getting to the Senate. Um, but more or less, he could pass a bill this week, and the Senate could amend it, um, and by amend it, you know, I completely tear it up. Uh, the House would reject their amendment. The government would then shut down. He may not get a bill passed at all. There may just be a series of appropriation bills. Either way, the... the um, idea of the Senate and House being on the same page by five days from now strikes me as uh, highly unlikely. And so um, if the government does shut down and a deal were to happen after that, I think that's very likely. And I think it would probably end up resulting in Speaker McCarthy being removed. Um, it's also possible no bill is passed at all out of the House. Uh, the Senate passes their bill and then some deal is reached between House moderates and, and Democrats to get it passed and a shutdown is averted, I don't think that will happen. Uh, but even then, I think that would remove Speaker McCarthy. So there, there, I can't figure out a path here on how he comes out of this okay. Um, and, I, and I don't blame him for that. I'm just simply stating the, the cards he's been dealt. Um, and I think it's all very unfortunate. The White House has said, oh, I love this. The, I forgot I did this. I think this is pretty funny. The White House has said that President Biden is going to Detroit tomorrow uh, to join union workers on the picket line. And uh, there's a picture of my interpretation in the dctoday.com. Uh, economically, S&P manufacturing came in flat on the month. Um, no big surprise there. 39,000 bankruptcy cases were filed in August. That is an 18% increase from last year. When I've talked before about bankruptcy cases picking up, I have really wanted everyone to understand the base effect by which they were picking up from very, 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 very low numbers. Now, if bankruptcies continue to escalate um, and it is off of more normalized numbers, you start looking at a real escalation. So I'm keeping my eyes on that. We're not seeing it at a severe level yet. And these are generally larger, smaller, and more individual bankruptcies, not, not a lot of credit impairment. 
Q3 real GDP is tracking to be quite robust. And again, predictive GDP trackers, particularly the Atlanta Fed one that is quoted a lot, they're not, they're, they are very volatile. They are um, unreliable in the sense that they can you know, be off by a pretty fair amount, up or down off. But nevertheless, um, there, there is some consensus view that you're going to have a pretty high number in GDP. And I only bring it up to just say that the recession predictors you know, have continually had to punt out their prediction. And maybe they end up being right. But at this point, if they end up being right, they're going to be right a heck of a lot further out than when the predictions began, which for some of us is considered being wrong. Okay. Uh, housing, uh, I did read the AEI Housing Center, HPA Index over the weekend. Kansas City, Grand Rapids, Columbus, Ohio, the three highest markets for year-over-year -year home price appreciation last month. The biggest drop in housing values came in Austin, Texas, a city called Deltona, Florida, and of course Phoenix, Arizona. And these three were all uh, year after year after year at the top of the list for uh, appreciation and you know, just clearly had some form of kind of resettling with a little bit of froth in their housing markets. Um, I did want to say, too, the New York return to office. I've been there for over three weeks and, it, and Manhattan is unbelievably busy right now. Now, of course, last week on the east side, it doesn't really count when you had the busyness of the United Nations General Assembly and... Uh, the president and, uh, coming to town and, uh, you know, uh, President Zelensky from Ukraine. I mean, it, you know, the east side uh, was a mess last, last week because of all that. But no, just in general, midtown Manhattan seems extremely crowded. But now there's a little data behind this. that Since Labor Day, there's a 17.6% increase in employees back to the office. Um, and this is based on an imperfect metric called the Castle Systems data, where they're just literally measuring FOB and key card use at 2,600 office buildings in 138 cities. So it's not perfect. They obviously don't have the key card FOB systems for every office, but nevertheless, within the, you know, it's still apples to apples is looking at their month over month comparisons and year over year comparisons. Even San Jose, California, where I happen to know up in the Bay Area, there's still quite a bit of technology workers not having gone back to the office. They saw an 11% increase there, but the city was up um, 18%. And I would point out, too, I can't remember. Oh, this was from LinkedIn, that job postings being advertised as remote are down to post-pandemic lows. They're down 56% where remote work um, is listed as part part of the job uh, feature. So um, wanted to share that data. Right now, futures show a 74% likelihood of the Fed not raising rates at the November meeting, a 55% chance of not raising rates at the December meeting. So all that to say, there's a lot of time between now and both November and December, a lot of data points that will come in. I still think the proper bet is that they're done raising rates. The futures are backing that up, but they're not backing it up as conclusively as I would think. And it doesn't help when you have people like Boston Fed President Susan Collins over the weekend talking about, you know, we can't take further tightening off the table. Um, specifically saying, and this is in quotes, the stronger cash positions of businesses and consumers have hurt their um, ability for tight monetary policy to work its way through the economy. It's basically a veiled way of saying you know, we would have been able to get more people to lose their jobs if businesses weren't holding on to so much cash. I mean, it's, you know, a strange thing to say. Um, oil price is pretty much flat today, still right around $90. Um, interesting in the energy markets, it was a pretty nasty week for markets last week. Stocks down, bonds down, commodities down, uh, utilities down, and yet midstream pipelines were up last week. So a little bit of bucking the trend there. Against Doomsdayism and Ask David, I'm going to make you go to the dctoday.com. Plus, I already mentioned there's a picture there that might uh, draw you in. So I'll let you go to the website for that. I thank you for listening to the podcast, watching the video, reading, listening, watching uh, uh, the DC Today. Every day is appreciated. And I look forward to being with you again tomorrow uh, here at DC Today. Mm -hmm.